only. You've never done a hard day's work. <laughs> Welcome, my lord, to Isengard. One of the most nervous aspects of the cast coming together was the fact that they'd never met each other before. That, you know, we'd gone around the world and we'd picked the best people for each of the roles individually. Met them, auditioned them, whatever, offered them the role, they'd accepted the role. We were happy. But the unknown thing was that none of them had worked together before. None of them, most of them had never even met each other before. So there was a very nervous moment when, when suddenly we're in New Zealand six weeks out from the shoot and everybody starts getting off the plane. When, when I was getting ready to go out, they said, when you get to Heathrow, uh, you'll be, you'll be travelling with someone called Orlando Bloom. I just left my, my family behind and my friends and my life, and I was like feeling a little bit teary, teary, you know, at the idea of uh, of leaving everything behind and my dog and everything. And um, I see this guy, you know, and I thought, he looks, elf-like. And uh, this wee fella walked over and he said, "You wouldn't be Orlando Bloom, would you?" He said, "Billy," and I was like. Uh, Oh my God, you're a hobbit. And we just had this huge embrace. And it was my birthday as well. I'd just turned 30 that day. So we had champagne on the flight. And then when we got to LA, because of the time difference, it was my birthday again. So we had more champagne, you know, because it's the 28th again. I'm kind of glad on this movie that I got to direct it and I didn't have to play a hobbit because, you know, those guys had, had a fairly arduous time of it. They had to get up at the uh, at some unearthly hour. How, how lucky are we to be in New Zealand to see this? That's half of why this movie is so amazing. This kind of stuff, every day. <laughs> My day would start within the 5 o'clock hour, uh, every day, for the most part. It's sometimes 4.30. That was lovely. The Hobbits would always start early because we had the prosthetics in the morning. Uh, our makeup took mostly about two hours. Glue was painted to the bottom of your feet. Then you would slide into these prosthetic feet. They would then hair dry uh, glue around the seams of your feet and paint them with airbrushes and paintbrushes. Standing up at five in the morning. And, and the whole time we're begging to sit down, but they don't let us. <laughs> they, they couldn't sit and have their feet glued on because the way that their ankles would sort of be bent in the wrong position. So they had to literally just stand up when I'm sure they'd rather be in bed. We have to be really honest and say that when the days that we don't have feet, we're really excited. Because <laughs> A, that means we have a later call, and B, we don't have to stand up for an hour and a half. I don't think my wife knows as much about my feet as Sean Foote. Isn't that ironic that Sean's last name is Foot? F O O T E. Sean Foot. O E? No. No E. I want to put an E on there because it's just too weird that your last name is Foot and that you work on my foot. My foots. No E. One of the amazing things about Elijah, I think, is he, he can sleep anywhere at any time. I mean, I've seen him do it. And, like, if they don't go back to him for, like, 15 minutes, he'll just be sitting there like that like for 15 minutes, and then someone will go, Elijah, yeah, yep, seen, right, and he goes, it's, a, it's an incredible thing that he's got. I mean, he must have been so tired during that shoot, because, you know, there was times when we had time off. Elijah pretty much had no time off, ever. I've seen him fall down three sets of staircases, like, and then just get up and go, and just walk up. And he's, that is a, an incredible gift, man. He's like, you know, like Chaplin. I sort of appointed myself as his kind of minder. You know, I wanted to look after him and make sure that he was okay. Sean was very much Sam for me, you know, always looking after me, being there for me. He kept locking his keys in his apartment and he'd leave and he couldn't get back in. And I was like, well, don't worry, I'll take care of it. And I would arrange, you know, uh, to have a locksmith brought out there and, and, you know, get his keys. And so he could continue going about having whatever fun he was having, you know, or talking to who he was talking to, and, and 45 minutes later, I bring him his keys, and Elijah, here's your keys. And he was like, oh, wow, great, thanks, you know, thanks for taking care of it. I saw the need for life to imitate art. Sam needed to look after Frodo as his sort of primary identity, uh, 
as the fellowship started to coalesce, that's how, that was the job I carved out for myself. John Aston is just a, a, a very cool man. He's, he, he had a different experience than the rest of his hobbits because he's got a family, of course. He was there with his wife, Christine, and, and, and his beautiful daughter, Ali, who we were all uncles to her at the end, you know. Sean is a very kind of untrusting individual when it comes to safety. He's going to hate me for saying this, but it's true. Uh, he, he always had to check out everybody else's job and make sure that they were doing their job properly because he didn't necessarily trust that they had it all under control. And there was one such instance when we were in a helicopter and we were in a kind of uh, treacherous mountain area. It wasn't easy to land and it wasn't easy to take off. And Lige, Billy and I were just having so much fun because we were in helicopters and we were saying to the guy, could you, you know, could you try and flip over or could you do some banks or, you know, cause you, how close could you get to that mountain? And, you know, if we put a bike down, could you pick it up by its wheels and all that kind of stuff? And they're talking and laughing and scratching, and I can see that, like, all three helicopters are making their way in, and ours is the first one to go, or second one to go. And I'm like, you guys, shut up. They're talking. They're like, Sean, and they know what they're doing. They're safe. And I'm like, oh, man, this is not good. And Sean immediately starts, like, drilling the, the pilot of the helicopter. Like, all right, do you, do you know, you know, that you've got, like, two guys behind you waiting to come in. Do you know, are you cool to, like, take off? And asking him all of these kind of safety questions that I'm sure this pilot had completely under control. And there was also a point where um, Elijah and I and Billy and Sean had been dropped off at lower altitude. And we were there for about half an hour waiting for a helicopter to pick us up. And we were throwing stones at trees and running around and, you know, having fun. Fun. And Sean was about a hundred yards away from us, and he was directing helicopters into land. You see, you see, you got two behind you. Hey, Bon. Come on in. You know, waving to the helicopter guy. You know, to pointing out where the other guys were, and they're waving me. And the hobbits were all making fun of me because I was like trying to be Mr. You know, involved. Billy Boy's a unique. Uh, guy. Uh, I'm so uh, just blessed to have met him, you know. Dom's an idiot. <laughs> no, that was great. Um, we were probably, I was probably closest with Dom because, you know, we had so much stuff together. We had a hiccup in the casting process because another actor had been cast in the role of Aragorn and we just came to a realisation that we had cast the role a little too young. It caused us a lot of headaches because we were now shooting the film, we couldn't stop shooting it and we only had a very limited number of days that we could shoot without the character of Aragorn. And I got a phone call at home um, saying, do you want to get on a plane tomorrow to go to New Zealand? And I said, for what? And then they said, you know, the Lord of the Rings. I knew that this was a very, very important conversation, that he'd never met me before, he didn't know who I was, I'd never met him, he'd never been to New Zealand before, he hadn't read the Lord of, Lord of the Rings. I just said, well, can I think about it for a minute? He said, well, not very long, you know, but you have till this afternoon. And, and we somehow had to try to persuade him um, to take this role because we thought he would be really great and we badly wanted him now in this movie, you know, we, we, I mean, we were in a real bind. And I hung up the phone and, and my son was, was with me then. He says, what was that about? Was that Lord of the Rings? I said, yeah, they're making a movie out of it. And, and he knew the story, you know, I didn't. And I know that uh, the person we really have, have to thank for um, persuading Vigo was his son, Henry. Because Henry was about, um, I think he was about 11 or 12 years old at that time, and he was a huge fan of The Lord of the Rings and absolutely was, was beside himself when he thought that his dad could get to play Aragorn. So it was nice to have his blessing, you know what I mean? Most times that you're with Vigo, something amazing is not too far behind. He's like an old-fashioned movie star in my eyes, you know, very gentlemanly and very polite and, uh, you know, very concentrated in his art, you know, in, in a word, I would, I would say, I would describe Vigo as, as being very inspiring. Being a, a, the natural leader of this group of actors in the Fellowship uh, came very easily to him. 
Well, he was always doing things like, you know, like he'd, he'd get all the key and, you know, I'm pretend to throw him over the edge of the mountain. <laughs> <laughs> you can see the wildness in his eyes. He goes slightly mental. Something kind of clicks. And then he just rugby tackled me for some reason, you know, really, like, bang! Go, oh, I, I wondered what would hit me, you know, and I just, you know, you know. <laughs> He's an extraordinary guy, really. I mean, he believes in the truth in everything he does, I think, you know, no matter what it is. And if he doesn't, uh, he doesn't do it. He's an incredible artist in so many different forms photography and painting and poetry and he he just lives for the moment it seems he lives for for life Vigo is an incredible photographer and he took a lot of photographs throughout the whole time and you know you sit at your little makeup station and there's a mirror in front of you and he just from the beginning day one started to you know make a collage all around the outsides of the mirror and by the end of the shoot there was no mirror left. They were overlapping. It was full of pictures, and then it became another layer and another layer. It's all the way up on the ceiling and wrapping around behind and trickling onto our mirrors. And he he was thinking of like you know buying the bus and taking it with him because it was such a brilliant collage of memories and moments. He doesn't just act the character. He he has to somehow become part of the character. He and the character have to have to blend. And Vigo, I think saw his sword as being the key into his character. And as a result, he didn't really want to go anywhere without his sword. Um, I know there were restaurants he'd go and eat in at the end of a day shooting where he'd carry his sword and he'd put it by the table as he, as he was eating. He wouldn't drive anywhere in his car without the sword being in the back seat. That was on the way out of a you know, Sunday rehearsal. And I was walking out of the gym all sort of sweaty, half in street clothes and half in airborne clothes, you know, waving the sword around, trying to keep a mental picture of what we'd just done, sort of. I guess walking down the street, down to where my car was parked on a Sunday afternoon, and waving the sword around and looking like, you know, this sort of desperate Rasputin character to them, probably. <laughs> Cop cars conversed on me, there'd been some report. The interesting mix that John put on the thing was that he's not a big fan of rehearsing too much uh, for the fight scenes. Uh, and his method would be to say to the stunt guys, how many of you are coming towards me? And they'd say, six. And he'd say, OK, who's first? And, they'd say, and the guy would go, um, I'm first. And he'd go, OK, you come at me and I'll hit you with my axe. And then you come and I'll hit you and you come. And, I, and he would just take these guys out. And the stunt guys were, you know, tough guys, big tough guys. They'd wear a lot of armor, and they'd say, "Okay, John, you know, uh, you know, try, try and miss us. But if you do hit us, it's not a problem. We don't mind." He would hit every single one of them. Someone would come at him, and he'd just bang, bang, bang. And uh, the stuff that they got of John fighting is brilliant because it's real. You know, the stunt guys are absolutely terrifying. <laughs> They're just running away from this guy. As you can see, the shots that you're getting are incredible. You know, he just looks on fire. But that is because John was wearing a prosthetic that limited his vision to this because he had, you know, prosthetic skin. And his eyes were swollen because he was allergic to the prosthetic, so they were slightly shut. And he, he, he had no kind of, you know, sideway vision. I mean, at, at times you just wanted to rip the damn stuff up and just scratch. Added to which I developed this topical eczema which meant that basically every time the, the upper and lower eyelids were attached, I, I lost all the skin in, in, in this area. It was like a skin peel. And within hours then it would swell, and it would turn sort of lobster pink, and then, you know, it, it would just be covered with lymph. And it was itchy and painful, and one felt very, very self-conscious. John Rhys Davies took us to a restaurant, and uh, it was when we'd, we'd only just started to get to know John, and uh, we sat down at this huge long table, and he, and he said, um, I think I will order the uh, food for tonight. And we said, oh, okay, on you go, John, you know, and we were all having a conversation, and the waitress came over. And John ordered, you know, food that would probably have fed maybe 35, 40 people, and there were about 12 of us, you know, he just said, We'll have nine lobster and 15 shrimp and 12 red snapper, 15 filet mignons and some grilled mushrooms. I'll have 12 onions and uh, wild boar and, you know, 
All this kind of stuff, just like pheasants and grouse. And, Do you have partridge? Bring the partridge, all that kind of stuff. And, um, you know, the, the brilliant thing about John is that because he's worked with so many amazing people and, and, you know, worked on some great jobs, all you need to do is give him the merest hint that you would like to hear something about a job that he'd done. And he's off.